friends, we are going to take a look at some old newsreels. They may be a little scratched and worn, but they still tell a story. For it so happens that they tell the story of a people who lived on an island, an island called the United States of America. It was a big island and a rich island. Here were the world's tallest buildings. Here were the world's longest bridges. Here were the most telephones and the most radios, the biggest irrigation dams and hydroelectric projects. Here were great industries that paid the world's highest wages. Here in abundance were iron, coal, copper, timber, limestone, and petroleum. All, it seems, all of the great basic natural resources. And in addition, here the farms produced more wheat, more fruit, beef, pork, mutton, milk, butter, eggs, and cheese than the people could eat. In other words, this island had everything, including the security of a broad ocean on either side. Yes, what if Germany should attack Poland and overrun Norway, Denmark, Holland, and France? Italy might invade Ethiopia and Greece. Japan might invade China. Nobody could invade this great island. And besides, why should they? Why should anybody attack us? No, nobody would attack us. That's what we thought. Well, folks, I don't think any of us need be reminded of Pearl Harbor. We had the industries, we had the resources. And besides that, we were good and sore. We'd arm ourselves, and we'd still meet our lend-lease commitments. That is, we would if... If Russia could hold the Germans in the Caucasus, and England held them in Egypt. The Japs and Germans had to be kept from meeting in India, cutting off Russia and strangling China. Because if this happened, well, we'd soon see an invasion of this hemisphere. That was plain to everybody. We'd been asleep, and while we'd been asleep, our enemies had planned long and well. From embassies and consulates in all the Americas, they had gathered more information on the Western Hemisphere than we had ourselves. In Latin America, hundreds of German embassies, consulates, and businesses had done everything within their power to make friends for Hitler and to broadcast suspicion and antagonism toward the United States. The same could be said of hundreds of German social and athletic clubs. Exactly as they had up here, all over Latin America, they had organized, trained, and in many instances, completely Nazified whole communities of largely German extraction. A riot here, a disturbance there, confusion, panic, and the fifth column takes over. Divide and conquer here as in Europe. German commercial airlines manned by reserve officers in Gehrings Luftwaffe had landing fields all the way up to the Caribbean each a potential bomber base within easy range of our Texas and California oil fields, our airplane plants in Los Angeles and San Diego, our shipyards on the Gulf, our industrial cities in the Deep South, and especially the Panama Canal. Here at home, we'd had another rude awakening. We had the industry, true enough. We had the coal and iron. But you can't make steel without manganese, and the Japs had taken our manganese when they took the Philippines. Likewise, our hemp. With the Malay states, they'd taken our source of tin. With British Malaya and the Dutch East Indies, they'd taken our source of rubber. No rubber, no airplane tires. No tires for mobile artillery for trucks and jeeps. No rubber for life rafts. No rubber for gas masks. Yes, it was as bad as that. Synthetic rubber we could begin to make, sure. And we did as fast as we could. But without the addition of a certain amount of live natural rubber, a tire, for example, just wouldn't stand up. With power from TVA, we'd been making more than enough nitrates for peacetime requirements. But suddenly, this was only a drop in the bucket. With the surrender of the Philippines, we also found we could not fight a war in the east without quinine, specific for malaria. True enough, quinine had come from this hemisphere. Even now in Guatemala, Costa Rica, Ecuador, Colombia, and Peru, there were scattered chincona plantings, trees whose bark would give us quinine. But these were not our trees. 
they belong to our neighbors. The same was true of natural rubber. Originally, it came from the Amazon. The trees were still there, a thousand miles up the river, but they had to be tapped by somebody. Somebody had to collect the sap, coagulate it patiently, a thin layer at a time over a low, smoky fire. Somebody had to transport it to the river bank. We needed rubber, needed every one of these balls bouncing into the river on the first step in their journey to us, and we needed somebody to get the rubber out. We knew they had tin in Bolivia, but again, somebody had to get it out. And the same could be said of copper in Chile. Somebody had to get that out. Chile could help us with nitrates for fertilizer and explosives. We needed all they had, all we could get, but somebody had to get it out. In Mexico and Cuba were extensive manganese deposits. And for our new walkie-talkies and radio communication systems, Brazil could supply quartz crystal. There are no substitutes, incidentally, for quartz crystal. No quartz, no radios. But again, somebody had to get it out. And even more important, they had to want to sell it to us, not to somebody else. Latin America could supply us with the industrial diamonds vital to our precision machinery. Latin America could send us balsa, essential in the construction of lightweight mosquito bombers and gliders. They could send us mahogany for PT boats, oils for sprays and paints. They could send us any number of things we had to have, but they had to want to send them, and that was that. Mexico had to want to keep sending us white arsenic, and Brazil wrote to for without sprays, there'd be no more fruit crop, no more bumper crops of corn and wheat. In fact, without certain Latin American insecticides, we'd soon be faced with a serious menace to public health. We had lost our hemp, but here in Mexico, in Central America and Haiti, grew sisal and henequen. Here were the mooring lines for our ships, our cargo slings and landing nets. But somebody had to harvest it and process it. Somebody had to get it out and want to get it out. Yes, we were the people who lived on the island that had everything, but we learned that we were not so self-sufficient as we thought. Well, folks, we got our rubber. Not all we could have used, but enough. We got our tin and our quinine. And what is most important, we got it in a hurry. It cost a lot of effort and a lot of money. Some people, I understand, have even said that it cost too much. But what I'd like to do is... Well, here's one of our flying cadets coming in from his first solo. Watch those tires, folks. I'd like to ask him what he thinks a little natural rubber is worth. Or the pilot of this fighter landing on a carrier deck. I'd like to ask these boys shaking with malaria in the Pacific what they think we ought to have paid for quinine. And going back to this meeting in Rio de Janeiro in 1942, I'd like to ask what the vote of confidence of these foreign ministers meant to us at that critical moment. For here we learned that what our Latin American neighbors had, we could have. What we were fighting for, we would all fight for. And this is something we must not forget. And now let us hear of the military contributions of our neighbors. From the commander of the Army Transport Command, Major General Harold L. George. For reasons of security, many of the contributions of our friends and neighbors in Mexico, Central America, the Caribbean, and South America cannot be revealed until after the war. But from a military point of view, in terms of manpower, the friendly cooperation of the other American republics has equaled the addition to our armed forces of at least several divisions. By swift mobilization, these good neighbors to the south nullified years of Axis scheming in this hemisphere. And today, thanks to their cooperation, our southern flank is secure against invasion. Besides delivering to us thousands and thousands of tons of critically needed raw materials, many Latin American republics have set up valuable coastal defenses. Others have made important air and naval defense bases available to us. 
and still others have provided us with sites for air bases from which today a steady procession of bombers and transports are taking off for the battlefronts of the world. Also, by way of these same bases, our casualties are being flown home for treatment and rest. Up and down shipping lanes, operating in conjunction with our own naval and air forces, sea and air patrols of Brazil and Mexico and the Caribbean Americas have hunted down enemy submarines. In line of duty, Latin American seamen have gone down gallantly in Latin American ships. In weighing the value of Latin America to the whole war effort, I think we can even say that without the other Americas, North Africa might be in enemy hands. This, if you remember, was the situation. Between Rommel on the outskirts of Alexandria and his objective, the Suez Canal, were the British under Montgomery, virtually cut off from supplies and replacements by sea as well as by land, in no condition, certainly, to launch an offensive. Here in the United States, however, half a world away, war production had just begun to hit its stride. But of what good were our tanks, jeeps, and anti-aircraft guns to Montgomery? What good were these millions of shells and these bombers and fighters if we couldn't get them to Cairo? But we had an idea. Planes could fly the Caribbean. They could also fly the Atlantic. And as a hub for this operation, Brazil had granted us an air base at Natal. Nearly everything you see, incidentally, runways, hangars, repair shops, warehouses, administration buildings, quarters for officers and enlisted personnel. All this could not have been built without the aid of Brazilian materials and labor. No more than could we have built a whole system of landing fields across the continent of Africa without first having had our base at Natal. For here, every tool, every item of equipment, even the runway surfaces had to be flown in. But the landing fields were built. Now with Natal as a hub, we opened our Trans-Caribbean, Trans-Atlantic shuttle to Cairo, flying by day and by night, sometimes direct from the factory, the largest assortment and volume of military cargo ever to be carried by air. We flew jeeps and small field pieces, airplane motors and spare propellers. We flew special ammunition, even drums of 100 octane gasoline. We flew spare tires and repair parts medical supplies, emergency rations, and bedding. And then with the cargoes, we often crammed technicians and specialists. For along with our equipment, had to go our own maintenance crews and personnel. In conceiving his global war, Hitler had overlooked just one point. With an air base on the bulge of Brazil, we could fly the Atlantic just as readily from west to east as he would have been able to do from east to west. Here in Cairo and Alexandria, you see being delivered to our allies the first trickle of material that swelled into a brimming stream. To the beleaguered British, this added equipment meant being able to turn from defensive to offensive action. It meant security for the Suez Canal. But to the Allied nations, to humanity, it meant even more than this. It meant hope, a first hope but a bright hope, for in the making was the complete rout of Rommel and victory in the Battle of El Alamein. Military experts have often referred to the Battle of El Alamein as a turning point of the war. It was the first step toward making the invasion of North Africa possible, an essential step before Italy and Europe could be invaded. In that battle and soon afterward in the invasion of North Africa and Italy, superior equipment and plenty of it, just as much as the high courage and determination of these fighting men, made possible this first crushing blow to the Axis partners and their dream to rule the world. But there would have been no superior equipment here. Let's not forget that. If it had not been for, yes, Natal. But we can go back even farther than that, as far back as the nameless labor recruit on his way to some rubber camp 2,000 miles up the Amazon. We can go back to the anonymous Brazilian quartz miner, the Bolivian tin miner, the Chilean nitrate worker. We can go all the way back to this man peeling chincona bark 
and 120 million other good neighbors to the South who in our most critical hour came to our aid. For they, too, fought in the Battle of El Alamein and in the invasion of North Africa. Just as they have been fighting at our side in Italy, in the South Pacific, and in Europe, and will continue to fight at our side on land, on the sea, and in the air, wherever Axis forces can be met and destroyed. Raw materials can be bought, yes, but good friends, never. Therefore, to our Latin American friends, we say in your words, gracias, amigos. In our language, that's thanks a million we won't forget. Thank <laughs> you.